Welcome to everybody. I'm really pleased to be here today. I love this topic, hack the curve. I think this is absolutely fabulous. Um, I've been doing a lot of thinking myself about uh, what's going on right now. And uh, uh, I really feel for all the companies that are out there actually raising money during this time, but there is a way of doing it. And uh, my prediction is business models are absolutely going to change going forward. And I'm gonna talk a lot more about that in, uh, in the future. But today we're gonna talk about hack the curve. A um, little bit about me, um, Shane covered a few things, but I just like to give people a bit of context about where I come from for creating this thing that I call the artful science of pitching. Uh, I do this pitch coaching, I, I really dislike the term, but I do this pitch coaching all across Canada. I was in the Yukon three times last year. I was in New Brunswick very many times last year um, uh, doing this. Uh, I have a background uh, in fundraising. I've raised over $40 million for companies that I've had C-level roles in. So these are operational kinds of roles. I'm also an angel investor, so I know what it's like to be on the investment side. Um, similarly, I'm on the investment committee for the Laurier Startup Fund, so I know what it's like to be receiving recommendations from analysts. In this case, it's uh, MBA students. And I do a lot of work in the ecosystem as an educator or an advisor and a director. So I get to see a lot of different things that are going on. And what I've tried to do over time is put uh, what I've observed and what I've experienced into this thing called the Artful Science of Pitching. Uh, Founder Institute calls me Canada's best pitch coach. And uh, I've been also called a startup whisperer. I've uh, done what I've done with well over a thousand companies. Uh, I've worked with a lot of companies here at DMZ. It's a, it's a great um, uh, member of the ecosystem, and I really appreciate being here. Um, this is my logo soup page, so you can see I've done this all over the place, and just it just repeats what I've just said. Um, I'd like to make today interactive. I guess we're not going to be too interactive today because uh, you're going to put your questions in, and Shane's going to give them to me, I, I guess, later. Uh, if there's an opportunity or a reason to be interrupted during this, I'm, I'm quite happy to be interrupted. Uh, because this is really your session, not mine. Uh, and I will be providing a PDF of this deck after the, uh, after the session. Uh, today's focus is to help you prepare for a presentation on April 23rd for Hack the Curve. Uh, you've got three minutes of uninterrupted time to make your case to a panel. Uh, with the, after your three minutes of pitching, uh, there'll be about two to three minutes of Q&A that follows. And the way we're gonna cover this today is I'm gonna go through the criteria that you need to meet in your pitch. And then I'm gonna take it a step further to talk about how you build a compelling story out of this. And remember the, the, back, the background to all of this is, uh, is all of the work I've done on both sides of the pitching fence and, uh, and the work that I've done with a number of groups. Uh, you've got five very clear criteria, equally rated, equally uh, weighted. Uh, for Hack the Curve, uh, there's the size and the importance of the problem being addressed. And you can look at this either from an economic or social point of view. Um, there's the quality of the lean business, lean canvas business model uh, that you're able to illustrate in your pitch. I'll talk more about that in a few more minutes. Um, and also uh, the innovative use of technology in your, in your solution. The third one's very important. What's unique about your solution? Uh, that's from the point of view of how you compare and how you stack up against competitors. Perhaps there's intellectual property that you've got in this, but there's also an element here that talks about uh, how a user or a buyer sees you as being unique and why they would choose you versus other options. Uh, the fourth one, clarity and effectiveness of the presentation and the quality of the market validation to date. So. Uh, in the course of telling your story, you're going to be evaluated on how well you tell that story and uh, included in that is uh, what you've done to validate your idea so far. And then lastly, the scalability of the solution, which is a big topic unto itself. And I'll cover that in a couple of different ways in just a moment. Um, I wanted to take a moment just to talk about uh, criteria versus the judging process. Um, I find sometimes that people put pitches together that m exactly meet the criteria, but they don't really tell a good story. And that means it's really not a good pitch. 
So when you're putting together a pitch for a competition where the criteria are very clear, you really have to think about how do I put it together in such a way that it tells a compelling story. Um, you got to think about how to take those topics, weave them into a story that's easy to follow, easy to consume, and it's memorable. And you don't just talk about things for the sake of talk about, talking about them. Everything you talk about has to have a reason, a focus. Uh, it's not about comprehensive coverage of your idea or your business. It's about the messages and how they interrelate that matters. Uh, you also have to think about the audience that you're speaking to. So uh, sometimes we speak differently to angels than we do to VCs uh, versus other audiences. Uh, you have to think about the stage that you're in um, and you have to think about the situation. What's the reason that you're looking for funding? Now, in the case of a competition like this, the situation is very clear. It's, it's you know, what, what are the ideas that you have to, to deal with uh, uh, the current situation? Uh, do not underestimate the value of a clean, easy to consume design in your pitch. Uh, that's very important to, to keep in mind um, because the easier you can make it for uh, the audience to get what you're talking about, the more likely they're actually going to get it and, uh, <coughs> and be able to act upon it. And then lastly, uh, memorability. So what you want to make sure of is if you're pitching, what are you going to do in your pitch and specifically at the end of your pitch to make sure that you're memorable versus the other pitches? This is particular, particularly true in cases where um, you're going to be uh, up for funding or uh, you need to be able to have some follow-up meetings with potential investors. And, how does somebody in the audience go back to their office and say, you know, I just saw this really cool pitch. Here are a couple of things I remember from the pitch. I think you should give this person a call. Uh, if that happens out of a pitch, it's a very successful pitch. Um, three stages of a judged event. Uh, of course, there's the pitch itself. And as I just described, it's more than just meeting the criteria. You got to tell the story. It has to be a compelling, a compelling story not just a product buyer story. In other words, not just about the product features and benefits and why people would buy it, but a holistic story about why an investor would care. The second part of a judged event is the Q&A. And the Q&A is really, really critical. A uh, weak Q&A could kill a really strong pitch and strong Q&A can recover a weak pitch. So Q&A is really a, a really key part of this, and you should be practicing, rehearsing and practicing your Q&A just like you do your pitch. Um, in Q&A, what judges are looking for is, uh, have you answered the question? Is it complete? Is it clear? Is it concise? And did you answer confidently? If you think about these things, it does not mean you give a five-minute answer to a 10-second question you try to answer the question as quickly as possible. What I tell people is think about whether or not you can answer the question with a very simple yes or no, and then follow it up with one or two statements that back up your answer. If you can do that, then go quiet. Um, the judges will fill in the, the quiet time with the next question. If you didn't answer the question, the person asking the question will ask a follow-up question. But if you did answer it, you'll get a big check mark because you answered it very quickly and tightly. And then lastly, there's the deliberations. This is when the judges go into their uh, little room and they talk about all the pitches they saw. They think about the criteria, they think about the pitch, the Q&A, and of course their own background comes into, into play here. If you're uh, talking to a panel, let's say they're all ex-bankers, then you can be sure that they're going to be very focused on things like the financial side of the business. <clears throat> if you happen to be talking to a panel of people who have manufacturing backgrounds and you're manufacturing a product, you can be sure that they're, th they're looking at things through a manufacturing lens. So in, in reality, the uh, judging panels are usually made up of mixed people. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you just have to think about who's on the panel and what are the kinds of things I'm gonna to need to make sure I cover so that people with certain backgrounds hear what, they're, what they came to hear. <coughs> Excuse me, I gotta take a drink. Um, this is how I look at a pitch. 
Uh, to me, a pitch is that part of the iceberg that's above the surface. Uh, you try to construct it as artfully as possible. This is why I call it the artful science of pitching. It's as good a story as you could tell about your business, but what you need to know is whatever you're talking about in that part of the iceberg that's above the surface, audiences are gonna draw conclusions about what's below the surface. That's why telling the story is really, really important. Everybody knows that there's all kinds of toxins and dangers that lurk below the surface, but it really depends on how well you tell your story as to whether or not people are gonna to go to the toxins and problems or are they going to appreciate the, the good part of your story? Uh, one of the ways that they'll do that is they're going to ask themselves, do the dots connect? Are you convincing? And if there is something that they have already read about your business, they're going to ask themselves, does this pitch jive with other collateral that I've already seen? For example, let's say you apply to a pitch competition. The pitch competition isn't for a month, but you put an application in, four weeks later you're pitching in front of the audience the last thing or the only thing the judges might have seen is your application but you've pivoted since uh since the application you've made some changes and all of a sudden you're talking about something different the judges are not going to get that that difference and you have to in your pitch build the bridge for them so that they understand why there's a difference in the application versus what you're pitching today so whether or not your pitch jives with other collateral is kind of the first question, but the answer has to do with whether or not you're actually building the bridge for them. So this is, this is my view. The, the uh, pitch is the top of the iceberg. Let's go back to your criteria for a moment. What I want to do now is uh, go through and talk about how you might tell a story that addresses each of these criteria in a very specific storytelling kind of way. Oops, wrong way. Um, so consider a flow like this uh, for a pitch. You'll notice this is seven pages or seven topics, even though there was five criteria. If this design, if this flow doesn't work for you, then just come up with your own that makes sense. Um, just the way you, you evaluate whether or not it works is ask yourself, does it, tell, does it tell a compelling story? Does it deliver what the judges need to hear? So I'm going to go through these seven items, but I'll just list them right now to, to begin with. So one is a strong introduction, followed by a description of the problem you solve. Um, you, we follow this with some sense of the size or importance of the problem. Then we bridge into solution. And then we get into a really core piece of the pitch here, which I'm calling next steps for the purposes of this, of this framework. And it's really where you would talk about all of the key things in your business model canvas that you haven't already talked about in the rest of the pitch. So this is the, think of this as the core uh, business discussion about your, uh, your idea or your business. Then the second last thing is we're going to talk a bit about the team and what we're really trying to convey here is confidence and credibility, um, whether or not you've attracted some advisors. And because every team typically has a gap, what are you doing to close those gaps? And then the last item is a strong closing, which is essentially what are the three things you want the audience to remember from your pitch? You follow these seven things and make sure that you cover the kinds of things that, that are uh, listed in the criteria, then you've got a good, clean, easy to consume pitch. Your challenge is doing all of this in three minutes. And uh, I know that's a daunting task, but I've done this countless number of times with people. I'm absolutely confident that uh, anybody's business can be described in three minutes and you can do it in such a way that you tell a story laid out something like this. So let's go into each of the items just uh, briefly and, and go over them. So the strong introduction. Well, you're going to get a strong introduction if you're confident from the, from the get-go. And if you could add into this an intriguing elevator pitch, and I'm talking about seven to 10 seconds. This is about something about your idea or what, what uh, caused you to think of this idea or something about this space, something that causes the audience to say to themselves, you know what, I got to listen to this. This is, this is, I got to really listen to this. This is really interesting. 
It's the, it's the thing that causes them to lean in. You have to remember that, that uh, judges and audiences listen to a lot of pitches. They're not going to be 100% attentive uh, start to finish in the whole event. So it's up to you to be able to do something that causes the audience to say to themselves, you know what, I, I really need to pay attention to this. One of the ways we do this is through a, a very short elevator pitch. Um, the second is the problem you solve. This is about a very clear articulation of the problem. And what you need to do is challenge yourself to distill complex problems into really easy to consume problem overviews. Very often uh, our businesses solve multiple problems or multiple aspects. Sometimes it's different uh, problems for different target segments. Sometimes it's a marketplace that you've got buyers and sellers on it, but you've got to look at it in such a way that at the end of this topic, at the end of this page, does the audience really understand what problem I'm trying to solve? And, uh, and that's, what you're, that's what you're after is, is that, uh, that check mark. Uh, the third item is, uh, so how big is this problem in the world and how important is this problem in the world? Um, it's really easy for large scale problems to, to quantify. It's a lot harder if your scope and your focus is narrow. You have to work a bit harder to defend the importance and the scalability of, of the problems. Um, and what's really important here is that what you're covering here really sets the stage for the audience, the judges, to understand whether or not this is a scalable business. Uh, very often we see people put very large numbers in for market sizing uh, without really understanding what the number means. And, very, and, and I will challenge people to say, you know, you just told me that this is a $4 billion market. Exactly what are you measuring with $4 billion? And nine times out of 10, I don't get a very good answer. So I always challenge people very, very careful, very much here to say, when you're sizing your market, Make sure that you're sizing the problem you solve, and then you can always defend it with people, and you could ultimately show the scalability of the problem. For example, if I'm solving a problem that a million people have, then I know that there's a million points of potential users or buyers here. If it's 10 million, I know there's 10 million. If the problem I'm solving happens uh, once a week for a million people, then I know that there's 365 million instances of the problem that happens every year for that million people. It's those kinds of things that we try to, to look at to determine scalability. So remember, what you're really doing here is setting the stage for the audience to understand that this is a scalable business. The fourth item is uh, what's your solution? You need to be very careful here to not present a product sell. Uh, the audience is not there to buy your solution. The audience is there to buy into your company or support the company. So you really have to look at this as how do I describe my solution in the context of an investment opportunity? Uh, but I do need to describe whether or not it solves the problem. Um, sometimes I have to describe how it solves the problem, but it all depends on the situation and it depends on how much time I have. But a key part of this is, what's the value proposition? Uh, if I have a solution, would I be better to describe the features and benefits of that solution, or would I be better to simply describe why a buyer would buy my solution versus other options? And I would argue that the value proposition will win 19 times out of 20. So the value proposition becomes very, very clear for uh, either a buyer, a user, or whoever the decision maker might be for purchasing or uh, acquiring your solution. Next steps, remember I said the next steps is kind of the core of this pitch. This is where you're gonna lean on your lean canvas for key points about your business model. Uh, you're gonna articulate things like your target segments or buyers or users or geographies or industries or whatever the case may be that you've described in your lean canvas. Uh, what are your go-to-market plans? Are you going to use uh, uh, part channel partners or are you going to uh, go direct yourself or are you going to do inbound, outbound? You know, what are you going to do to attract people to uh, your product? 
If you're selling through a website, what are you going to do to fill the top of that funnel with as many, with, with as many eyeballs as possible? Um, you'll talk about the scalability of the solution in the business. If you, if you have a market opportunity that uh, you could sell to, let's say, 100 million potential buyers or users, then what is it that you can say about your business to, uh, to show that you understand what it would take to scale the business to support 100 million users? Doesn't mean you have to have the, all the answers today. Doesn't mean you have to have all the plans in place, but a recognition of the scalability of your operation becomes important. What happens if you're manufacturing a product? Uh, how are you gonna manufacture that product uh, at the scale that you need? Where are you gonna manufacture it? And with the current situation that, that is here now, uh, that whole question about where you're manufacturing becomes ever more critical than, uh, or becomes more critical than ever. Uh, no longer are you going to be able to rely on certain supply chains or delays. So what are you doing to source, source locally? Um, I'm talking about goods and services. Uh, what are your revenue and cost models? How do you make money? Uh, what's your gross margin? Are there any key metrics about your business that you should put on the table? If you have a SaaS business, it would be really wise for you to put a couple of SaaS uh, targets or metrics on the table. If you're not a SaaS business, you can't go wrong about uh, talking about gross margin. And then I put et cetera here because there may be something unique about your business. Sometimes this is the case with marketplace businesses, but something unique about your business that you need to be able to talk about. And just because it's not on my list or just because it's not in the lean canvas doesn't mean that you don't talk about it. You, you really need to be able to identify those things that are important to your business. Um, let's go on to number six. Uh, the team. Um, this is where you get to talk a little bit about who's on the team, not for the purpose of the judges or the audience knowing exactly who everybody is, but what's the source of your credibility for the particular space you're in. Sometimes the credibility is you've got deep education in this. Sometimes uh, people have written a thesis on this and they're graduating with a, an advanced degree with, a, with great depth in this area. Sometimes they've got business experience that they could lend to it. Sometimes it's purely interest. You know, this is something that I've been working on for years and uh, me and my team just, uh, just love this space. But when that happens, you still have to address things like gaps on the team. Sometimes we close gaps by bringing strong advisors and circling us with certain advisors. Uh, but other times we need operational roles on the team and uh, the audience would really like to know what it is you're doing to close those gaps uh, over time. So we've got, a, we've got a question from the audience, Frank. So I'm gonna yes. pause you just for a second. So uh, this question is around one of your earlier slides. So they're wondering to know what advice do you have for those of us who are using or are a social enterprise, which may not be as profitable as a traditional kind of VC backed business? Um, well, it comes back to a couple of things. One is, um, let me just go back here. So right off the bat in the introduction, you can make the case for um, a, social, a social good that you are uh, chasing or trying to make happen. And then through the pitch, there's going to be, you know, what's the social problem? What's the, um, uh, what's the social good you're trying to make happen? Uh, the importance and the size are going to be the same. You know, the, que the question is, is this big, is this important? Uh, solution will be the same. In the next steps, uh, the revenue and the cost model. So what you have to talk about in a not-for-profit situation or in a case where profit is less important than other things is how are you going to sustain this business? What's the method that you're going to use to ensure that you're going to be around tomorrow and the day after to provide these goods and services in, in the um, uh, for the for the purpose of of making your mission happen, uh, does this mean you're going to rely on grants? Does it mean you're going to rely on uh, donations? Does it mean you're going to be selling some things to uh, enterprises to ultimately provide resources to support uh, other target markets? You know, the real question is 
how are you going to sustain the business? So from that point of view, there's really not a lot of difference versus uh, for-profit businesses. The key difference with not-for-profit businesses is uh, you're talking, you're generally talking to a more narrow audience uh, when you're when you're talking to investors. Uh, that's okay because not every investor is going to invest in every business all the time, uh, but it just means that you have to be very very clear about what your value proposition is for that investor. I see another question here. Uh, how bad is it perceived if you don't have a co-founder or a team? Um, it, it's, it's not that it's seen to be bad, um, but it's weak compared to other companies that have co-founders or teams. And let me explain that for a moment. Um, if you're a, an early stage company and you plan to be developing the business and at the same time raising money, I tell everybody it's a really difficult thing for a single founder to do. So finding a co-founder becomes very, very important for that because raising money could become a full-time job someday and developing the business is a full-time job other days. And you unfortunately don't have control over which days that happens. So uh, it's a lot better to have two people than, uh, than one person. Um, the uh, the other part of this is if you're a single person today with an idea, uh, then one of the things you want to talk about is what's your plan to attract more people to the team? How are you going to bring people in? When are you going to bring people in? What are the kinds of skills that you're looking for? Um, who are your advisors? Advisors become a uh, safety valve for people that don't have fully formed teams because you can always say you know we don't have a person in marketing right now but we've got this advisor who is really skilled in marketing and they're giving us help until we can uh, until we can uh, find that person um, so in part it's about what's your plan and uh, secondly it's if you're thinking more broadly about raising money and developing the business then i really encourage you to be thinking about how you find a co-founder or at least uh, somebody that you could really trust that you could bring on the team and so um, frank you may have seen uh, this question but if not and, and this might be a little bit too vague but they want to know if you have an example of a really perfect seven second elevator pitch uh I, i'm gonna come back to that one at the end if that's okay of course. Um, and let's see, what's the next one here? During this challenge on MVP. Yeah, I'll come to these questions at the end. I'm almost finished, actually. Um, so keep the questions coming. Uh, we'll, we'll make sure that every, every question gets answered. Um, so the seventh item, this is the one after the team, is your strong closing. And what you want to do here is repeat the three things that you want the audience to remember. <laughs> I got remembers. To remember. Um, this is no new information. What you're really doing is just recapping it for the panel or for the audience. And what's often, what's often going to happen in a pitch is this page, this summary page, is going to be on the screen longer than the rest of your pitch combined. So it becomes very valuable real estate. This is the opportunity for you to keep really key information up on the screen for the audience, be they judges or others, to read. If you have to go to a backup page to answer a question, uh, then do so. But I also find that uh, if you could answer your questions without going to backup, it just shows that you understand your business really, really well. And uh, it will impress judges if you could answer Q&A questions without having to go to backup. Um, so this page is, is basically a summary. You can see on the left side the five criteria. And on the right side is a potential flow. Uh, by all means, if you think you have a better flow that suits your business and the story that you want to tell, then, uh, then go ahead and rework this a little bit. But if you're uh, challenged for finding a flow, then uh, this, is, this is one that, uh, that could work. Um, so now I'd like to go to the questions and uh, here, I can read them off for you just to make things uh, easier. So the, we'll go back to the first one. So what examples of a great seven second elevator pitch have you seen or heard, or what should people keep in mind as they are trying to develop that seven second elevator pitch? Um, you give me a moment, I'm gonna bring up a, another screen here um, because I, I'll show you something that, uh, 
that I use when I talk about elevator pitches. Give me just a moment here. Sure, and just in the meantime, as Frank is pulling that up, for all of you who are a part of the Hack the Curve program and are in our Slack community, I did post earlier today a few different examples of different types of template decks that I've come across. I uh, highly encourage all of you to uh, look through them and incorporate those decks into the uh, suggestions that Frank has made as well. I think the important thing to remember is that some of these deck templates were made not for a three-minute demo day presentation, so don't feel like you have to cram all the information that the templates are looking for in this three minute presentation. Dang, I, I really wanna find this because I, I can't remember it anymore. <laughs> it's like, I spent a lot of time in putting that one together. I'll uh, just take another moment here. Actually, I'll go to the next question and then I'll come back to that elevator pitch. Okay, um, perfect. So the next question is, uh, during the challenge, we'll have an MVP ready to be sold, but the real scalability and profitability will be reached after the challenge, smart contracts in our case. Do we have to pitch the solution with the smart contract feature? We are working hard to have a workable smart contract for the demo day, but we aren't sure if we'll actually have it for the date. So this, the, what this question speaks to is, uh, what's your roadmap? Uh, roadmap is a part of that uh, next steps that I talked about. You know, when you talk about the key things from your business model, business model canvas, your product roadmap says you're going to have certain features in place by a certain point of time that moves you from MVP version one to MVP version two to commercial version one, commercial version two, and so on, and when you do that, it opens up your target markets. You may be starting with, uh, just for argument's sake, let's say the Toronto area. And then when you go to MDP2, you might go to Ontario. And when you commercialize, you might go to all of Canada. And when you go to commercialized version two, you might go to all of North America. That's part of the story you have to tell in the next step. So if you don't have something ready for the, the pitch day itself, that's okay because what you have to do is tell the story about where you're going from today, how you got to today and where you're going from today. And it could be a simple timeline that you put up. And, and you know, I'm gonna emphasize the word simple here. This needs to be really, really easy to consume. So don't put a timeline up that's got a lot of small text on it. Don't use my pages as examples of good pitch uh, pitch form because this isn't intended to be pitching. I'm, I'm teaching. Uh, you really want to have uh, as little content on the page as possible because you want people to get it. Um, uh, so it, it comes down to a roadmap. Um, next question. Got it. And so uh, the next question that we have, and this is one that I'll definitely take a stab at first and then pass it over to you, Frank, based on your experience with pitch competitions is they want to know if this competition is more about selling a willing a winning idea or having a workable product and and so i'll answer this first from my perspective i think from the dmz we recognize that everyone coming into this competition is entering at a different stage which means comparing a company that has an mvp already to a company just at the ideation stage wouldn't be very fair uh, what we're looking for is what has that progress been at least of what I'm looking for is what has that progress been in the two weeks of the competition to show that, you know, you have a great team who's going to execute, who's going to hustle, who has a lot of ingredients that we look for, for that ideal uh, startup fit. And for the DMZ itself, you know, we really want to see if we can kind of get you to a point where after the competition is over, this is still something that you continue to want to do. Uh, I would look at that as success if, you know, a few teams came together who didn't have history with each other or didn't have anything before the program and with a business that they want to continue forward. You know, the prize money, I think, is great and it definitely is an asset. But Frank, I'm sure you've seen this before. I've seen a ton of companies not actually win the demo day, but end up winning in the long term. Uh, because their idea was great or because the product was great and they just may not have articulated it as well in the demo day as perhaps other people. But Frank, curious to hear your thoughts on that. 
Oh, it's absolutely true. I mean, you know, when you go into a competition, the, the idea is to try to win the competition, but um, you don't always capture the, the judges fancy in a competition, but you may capture people in the audience. And if you can capture people in the audience, they're going to come up to you and say, that's really interesting. I'd like to learn more. And before you know it, they're talking about potentially investing or supporting you. Uh, of course, if you win the competition, you're going to get those people coming up as well. But sometimes there's just a mismatch between uh, the judges and the presenters versus the uh, the audience. And so, you know, I wouldn't lose faith at all uh, if you didn't win the competition. There's there's always uh, other ways of, of attracting interest. Uh, if you have a good competition and people are uh, are liking what they see they'll come see you shane are there going to be uh, who's going to be on who's going to be seeing the comp the uh, pitches that's yeah that's 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 a great question frank and i'm sure a lot of you in the audience have the same question so how we're going to do be doing it is just because of the sheer quantity of teams we have over a hundred teams in Hack the Curve, if you can believe that. We're gonna be doing two rounds of pitching. We're gonna have a semifinals, which is gonna be taking place on Wednesday of next week, where we're gonna be uh, whittling down those 100 companies to our top six. And then those top six are going to be presenting in our finals, which will be happening on Thursday afternoon. Okay. Uh, I see a question here about seven yes. slides in three minutes. Yes. Um, yeah. So, you know, doing seven slides in three minutes is definitely uh, very challenging. And I would say, and it doesn't say who actually answered this question, but I would say that the three minute demo day format has, has certainly been one that's been around for quite a while. So it isn't too much of a foreign concept. Uh, one of the great things I encourage people to do is look at and there's a lot of content out there on YouTube, on different websites of really great demo day presentations. And I think it's a good kind of rule to look at what these people have done in their pitch to get attention um, and do a three minute slide without it feeling like it's rushed. I would say the only reason why it may come across as rushed is if you're just not simply prepared for it. But Frank, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, re re rehearsal becomes really key here because uh, as you put it together, your your first slot, your set of slides, whether it's seven slides or six or eight, whatever works for you. And let's say you time yourself and the first time you do it, it comes out to five minutes and you kind of slap your head and you say, oh man, how am I going to get this down to three minutes? I assure you, you're not alone. Um, a couple of months ago, we did a, a, a demo day for called a corridor demo day. We had about 40 companies pitch one morning back to back. Every single one of them were three minutes or less. Uh, we worked with them uh, to get them down to the three minutes, but every single one of them did three minute pitches. Uh, none of them seemed overly rushed. And I would tell you that some of them, oh, I, I don't think any of them had less than seven slides. And some of them had uh, literally 12, 13, 14, 15 slides. It all depends on the, the amount of content you have on a slide and how you use the slides in your delivery. So uh, to answer the question about, you know, seven second uh, pitches, uh, absolutely doable. And, uh, and it just takes a little bit of practice, but you can get there. I have, I have confidence that you'll get there. Perfect. Awesome. And so this, is, this next question is one that comes up quite often, and I've definitely seen varying opinions on this. But the question is, should only one member of the team present and do the Q&A on demo day? Or should other members of the team jump in, whether through the presentation or during the Q&A? So there's a couple of parts to this. Uh, by and large, uh, my recommendation is to have one person pitch. I I've run into situations where I've supported uh, a, 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 a company to say, yes, I think two or three of you could be pitching. But it's, very, it's for very unique reasons. But by and large, it's one person that pitches. When Q&A happens, that one person is the one who's fielding the question. Think of that person as a quarterback. And if they think there's a better person on the team to answer the question, they redirect the question to that person. But to the, the advice to the other team members is you don't jump in and answer the question. 
Uh, for the purpose of that pitch, there is one person on the team who's in control, and that's the person who's pitching. I don't care if they're the CEO or the CTO or whatever role they have, but they're in control for that pitch. And it's up to them as to whether or not they're going to invite somebody else on the team to either answer a question or help answer a question. So it's mm -hmm. all about showing control and leadership. Mm -hmm. And I would, and I would definitely echo that the amount of times I've seen, you know, the, the, the speaker answer a question and then another person from the team kind of jump in to add their input and either, you know, sometimes they'll try to correct something that the, the speaker said, or they'll start to contradict each other. It just gets things really messy. And once again, with the presentation only being three minutes and then the Q and A being an additional three minutes, you want to keep things as simple as possible to mitigate any risk of there being failure amongst the process of different people speaking, answering questions, stepping over each other, et cetera. All right, so moving on to the uh, next question that we have is, is it a good idea to show pictures and video of the design of your product? And then if yes, when would be the best time to do so? Uh, before, during, or after the pitch? Or maybe I should say at the start, the middle, or the end of the presentation. Mm -hmm. So that's a really good question. Um, I'm not a fan of video. Uh, there is way too many things that can go wrong when you're trying to do video. If you're in a room and using a projector, you're typically using somebody else's PC. Uh, if you're on Zoom, you never know what, what kinds of things could go wrong. I try to avoid video as much as possible. If you have to show something that's got some movement in it, think about whether or not you can condense a couple of seconds into a GIF and show the GIF, uh, but you'll want to test it to make sure that it works properly when you're when you're pitching. Um, as to uh, photos of the product or design of the product, yes, they're helpful, but but beware that anything that's got small small text or fine details in it are not going to be very visible to the audience. Uh, they're more likely to roll their eyes than try to get really close to the screen to try to see something. If there's something you have to show, then you could show, for example, um, uh, a wiring diagram with a magnifying glass over the key part that you want to show, and show that piece in really good de in in a large large uh, font or large scale. Um, you know, but just think about how hard it is for people to be able to see what they're what you're showing them and to get the message that you want. The last thing I'll mention is for those that have uh, apps, whether they're phone apps or web apps, screenshots make for terrible graphics. They're not designed to be uh, displayed, they're designed for user interaction. And as a result, you can't, you very often can't read the text that's on a, on a screenshot. So be very, very careful about how you use screenshots. If you absolutely have to show something on a screenshot, then use that uh, magnifying uh, technique. You might be able to show the whole, I don't know, whole phone screen, for example, and then blow up the part that you want people to see. Just keep in mind that what you're, you're showing people the graphic for a reason and focus on the reason and make sure that they get that reason as opposed to squint. I hope yeah, it, and, I, and I would just echo Frank's comment around also be careful of the trap of trying to put so much information on your slides because you do only have three minutes. I've seen people try to explain incredibly complex technical applications of their business in a three minute presentation. And unless you have very, very deep domain expertise, it's just going to go over your head. And as soon as you lose the audience, game over for your presentation. I can add to that to say that in, in oh, the vast majority of cases, judges and audiences in pitch events really don't care about that level of detail. They're looking for the top line story about what problem do you solve, how do you solve it at a high level, and more importantly, what are you going to do with this idea? What's that next step? What's that go to market? That's what they really came to hear. Sorry, I'm just typing an answer to one of the questions. So a next question that we have is, if the COVID-19 crisis just killed our last two years of value proposition and will not recover after the crisis, and we are using the COVID-19 crisis to reinvent ourselves with the solution we are presenting, do we have to say it? So maybe it's how truthful do you have to be in your presentation in terms of how long you've worked? 
on the business and how you came to a result of it? Well, I, I think th this is a most interesting question for me because I've spent a little bit of time in the last uh, week or so writing about this. So I'm going to publish it very soon. Um, I, you know, COVID-19 has really changed the landscape. Uh, people are going to be a lot less interested in the before COVID, the BC time period, uh, about what you did and how you did it. They're going to be much more interested in how are you responding today during COVID. And as we get through this current, this first wave, and we get into the summertime, what are you going to be doing to uh, retool the business for a post-COVID world? recognizing that there's probably another wave or multiple waves of COVID down the road. So what's happening is investors are going to take a very keen interest in your understanding of the risks to your business and what you're doing uh, to de-risk the business. I'll give you a very specific example. Let's say that you're manufacturing a product and um, the first couple versions of that product you manufactured in Canada, you finally got to the point where you're going to grow and scale the business and you're now manufacturing your product overseas somewhere. Well, the, your supply chain has just been massively disrupted. So what are you going to do down the road to mitigate against that risk? Does that mean that you have to think about how you manufacture locally? Does it mean you manufacture some things remotely and some things here? How does that affect your cost structure? How does that affect uh, the way you're dealing with risk? Let's think of it from a services point of view. If you have services that you've outsourced and they're critical resources, uh, what have you done to be able to overcome the problem now that COVID-19 is here? And what are you going to do going forward to prevent that problem from coming back again? Nobody was really planning for a global pandemic like COVID-19 in, in any of, of their risk planning. But now that it's happened, the likelihood that it happens again and another bad virus comes along or you know, a COVID-20 or a COVID-21 comes along uh, and the same kind of response happens because they determined it worked, uh, what are you gonna be doing for your business and your business model? Uh, all of those things are going to be much more important to investors than the past two years. There's no doubt in my mind. Got it. Thank you. And thanks for providing that, uh, that answer. So I know we are getting very close to time. So I did want to circle back to see um, if we... I, if we address the seven second question, I just know that that was our first question. I know you weren't able to pull up the slide. Yeah, no, I, I have it here. So. Okay, perfect. So let's go to that. Um, unfortunately, everyone else, that'll be the last question just because of time. But for those of you who are curious about pitch coaching, uh, this is where we're gonna ask you to lean on the mentors who were assigned to you. A part of the conversations you should be having with them is practicing your pitch as you are getting closer to Wednesday of next week. That's what I'd encourage all of you to reach out to your mentors to speak with. Okay, can you see a screen that says elevator pitch example? Correct, yeah. Okay, good. So here's an example, and I, I use this to kind of illustrate a couple of points, and you'll, you'll, they'll be clear in a couple of minutes here. Um, the setup here is that uh, uh, I am somebody that Pat, a person named Pat, has been wanting to meet, and they happen to step on an elevator where I am. I just pressed 45 on the elevator, and they now know that they've got a couple of moments here that they can uh, spend with me. Now, I've known Pat from the past, and so they're, they're going to reintroduce themselves to me. So I might say, you know, Pat, I haven't seen you in five years. What are you up to? And Pat would say, actually, I've been hoping to run into you. We've developed an optimally sized, open and standards compliant operating system for the Class A compatible and Class B microprocessor units found in low-end intelligent enabled appliances. I think that's probably in the seven to 10 second range, maybe 10 seconds, give or take. If I heard that and I had previously pressed 45, I'm likely pressing 15 on the elevator, trying to get off that elevator because I really don't want to hear this. This is an example of a supremely bad uh, elevator pitch. I'll give you a, an example of what one looks like that could be a little bit different. 
So same opening. I haven't seen you in five years. What are you up to? I say, thanks for asking. I founded Smart CPU. We've developed the best in class operating system for smart devices like your toaster. We cost less and leave more room for the apps that make your toaster smart. We're proven and I need investment to commercialize. I'd love to tell you about our plans. The difference between these two elevator pitches is really uh, stark. If you think about what I did in the second one, I actually thanked the person. I've told them what I've done in the name of the company. I've told them what we've built. I've given them the purpose of the product. I've, I've made it familiar uh, by referring to toasters. I've talked about value propositions. I've given them something intriguing to think about. I've given them my, sta my status, my stage, and my ask. I've told them what I want to use the money for, and I've asked for the next meeting, all in roughly the same amount of time. Now, the point of this is that you have to think very carefully about what you're going to say in the span of seven to 10, or in the case of actually meeting in an elevator, maybe as many as 15 seconds. You have to be very careful about what you're going to say, and it takes some time to figure it out. For the purpose of a pitch, which, which is gonna be a little bit different, you think about what, what are the a uh, couple of phrases that I'm going to include in my pitch and how do I distill something like I, what I just described into something that's a lot shorter. For example, here, when it comes to my elevator pitch, I might say smart CPU has developed the best in class operating system for smart devices like your toaster. We cost less and leave more room for the apps that make small appliances smart and life easier. It's enough to get me interested and on the screen, all I would show are a couple of key phrases that cause the audience to say, you know what, like this sounds kind of interesting. It's not a repeat of everything else I'm going to talk about. It's not an attempt to distill seven pages into one or two sentences. It's only for the purpose of giving the audience some sense of the space that you're in and why, and some indication as to why they should listen. I hope that helps. Okay, perfect. Well, Frank, once again, thank you so much. I think this was a perfect slide to end off in just to give the participants an idea of what it is they need to do to develop their deck. Once again, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get to all of the questions. That typically happens as Frank is a very popular person, but we will be making this recording available for all of you uh, either later on this week or sometime early next week. The deck we will also send out to all of you uh, very soon. And as I said, please look at the resource channel for the Hack the Curve uh, Slack group where I posted quite a few different templates and examples for you, know, you to utilize. Uh, with that said, Frank, once again, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Oh, you're, you're the right. virtual applause once again for all of you. Uh, <laughs> thank you again. Shane, one other thing, I'm, I'm gonna take these slides that I just showed you on the elevator pitch, I'm gonna add them into the deck, so. Awesome. Um, and if there's, do you have a, a list of all the questions that were asked? I do, I do. Okay, can you shoot those to me? Of course, happy to. What I'll do is I'll, I'll look through those and if there's things that I think I should add to the document, I will and that's what I'll send you for distribution. Awesome, yeah. I will send those over to you and I'm sure you're gonna make a lot of folks in the chat who didn't get their question asked very happy. Um, once again, I will wrap things up just because uh, I know we, we can't keep you and all of you uh, past five, but looking forward to seeing all of your presentations on Wednesday and Thursday of next week. As I said, I encourage all of you to reach out to your mentors to start to talk about setting up some time on the Monday or Tuesday next week to do your uh, demo day pitch practice. And if any of you haven't heard from your mentor, please let me know and we will look into that further for you. Frank, once again, thank you so much. We appreciate it for everyone who joined live and in the future. Thank you for sticking through it. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And once again, thank you very much and stay safe, everyone. All right. L live smart, everybody. <laughs>